What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Turnbuckle Topics Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Deneen, and this is my review of SmackDown, which took place January 26th. It was a solid go-home show leading into the Royal Rumble later tonight, with the first pay-per-view or premium live event for WWE in 2024 taking place in St. Petersburg, Florida. And it's looking to be a good card, a very small card at that, which uh, in this following episode, I'll get to my predictions later. But believe it or not, it's only a four-match card that we have here, folks, which is, you know, very surprising. Usually with Triple H running things as of late, we're used to those NXT TakeOver type of cards where we get four, uh, you know, more than four, at least five, six, sometimes seven matches. Uh, but here we only have four, the Men's Royal Rumble, uh, the Women's Royal Rumble. And then, of course, we have the United States Championship where Logan Paul will be defending against Kevin Owens. And then the Fatal 4-Way for the WWE a universal championship that Roman Reigns has held now for the better part of, uh, what, three, three and a half years uh, up against AJ Styles, LA Knight, and Randy Orton. So uh, following this episode, I will have my predictions episode out for the Royal Rumble, top to bottom, soup to nuts. So I will cover everything uh, involving the Rumble, the Rumble matches, breaking down the specifics of the men's and the women's Royal Rumble matches. A whole lot to get to, but let's get to this SmackDown review uh, before anything else. Now, we got some breaking news 30 minutes or so into SmackDown. They didn't tell us... They didn't tell us this on a SmackDown, but it was going all throughout the internet. And there were, there was a report that said, breaking news, Vince McMahon has officially resigned from WWE and UFC parent company, TKO Group Holdings. Now, this news was kind of kind of surprising. Uh, not quite as surprising as the news we got Thursday. Uh, you know, we, we found out this bizarre report uh, regarding Vince McMahon, which this all came about and as to why he's removed completely. Uh, if you want to do the research on your own, if you haven't already in the last 48 hours or so, by all means, go look it up at your own discretion. It's pretty gruesome stuff uh, in regards to Vince McMahon and company. Uh, but anyway, Sean Ross Sapp uh, retweeted a statement from Nick Khan, the WWE president, that said, I want to inform you that Vince McMahon has resigned from his positions as TKO executive chairman and on the TKO board of directors. He will no longer have a role with TKO Group Holdings or WWE. Again, this is WWE President Nick Khan with his statement. And last but certainly not least, this was Vince McMahon's statement in regards to this whole situation. He says, I stand by my prior statement that Miss Grant's lawsuit uh, is replete with lies, obscene, made-up instances that never occurred, and is a vindictive distortion of the truth. I intend to vigorously defend myself against these baseless accusations and look forward to clearing my name. He then goes on to say, However, out of respect for the WWE universe, the extraordinary TKO business, and its board members and shareholders, partners and constituents, and all the employees and superstars who helped make WWE into the global leader it is today, I have decided to resign from my executive chairmanship and the TKO board of directors effective immediately. Now, this is great news because, you know, like Vince McMahon or not, I don't know how you really could uh, defend him in this situation. Uh, that all this news that came out Thursday, it, it's there's been so many instances with Vince McMahon, not just recently, but even in the past, that it's very hard to stand up for this guy or defend him in any which way. But Slim Jim, who's been a longtime sponsor of WWE, if you're a Golden Era fan, just like myself, late 80s, early 90s, when I first became a fan, Slim Jim and WWE or WWF at the time have been synonymous with one another. I know you all remember those commercials with the Macho Man Randy Savage, even the Ultimate Warrior. And when Slim Jim was really uh, getting back uh, very popular with WWE last year, the new faces of Slim Jim on those advertisements were LA Knight and Bianca Belair. And so Slim Jim pulled their sponsorship as of early Friday uh, for the Royal Rumble, which is huge. Again, they're a major sponsor uh, with WWE. But once this news broke uh, in regards to Vince McMahon leaving, exiting the company completely, uh, they're back on board. You know, we got some news that, uh, early Saturday morning uh, that after Vince McMahon's resignation took place on Friday night, Slim Jim is back as one of the main sponsors for the Royal Rumble, which is good to see. I'm glad to see that again. And, and Slim Jim went out and uh, put out a statement that said, Slim Jim values integrity and respect in all of our partnerships. Given the recent disturbing allegations against Vince McMahon at this time, we've decided to pause our promotional activities with WWE. This decision reflects our commitment to our brand values and responsibility to our community. We will continue to monitor the situation and base our future engagements on our values and what's best for our brand. Now that came out uh, immediately Friday when they said that they were pausing uh, their you know, deal or sponsorship with WWE. But now that we know that they are back on board 110% going forward since this Vince news, 
uh, that is, that's the latest and greatest, uh, at least in regards to Slim Jim, not so great for Vince McMahon. So again, I didn't go into any, any of the specifics in regards to this whole uh, Vince McMahon situation as of late, these allegations that broke early Thursday. Vince McMahon's been having problems publicly uh, since early 2022 uh, that we've you know, all known about, and that's why he stepped down in July of 2022 initially, uh, seemingly bullied his way back on the board last January, and now here we are a year later, and the whole situation is uglier than ever, uh, but the good news is is that he is gone, uh, TKO and Endeavor can clean their hands of Vince McMahon for now, uh, well, hopefully forever, um, and he'll have to deal with whatever he has to deal with, uh, all the legalities uh, outside of WWE. It's certainly not something you want to see for WWE leading into one of their core four pay-per-views this weekend, Royal Rumble, the first one of the year. And uh, again, Triple H more than anybody I feel for. Obviously, I feel for all of us fans, but Triple H, who's done such a great job, uh, you know, trying to keep the train on track here, regardless of what's been going on with his father-in-law, uh, a distraction one way or another, whether it's creative control uh, all of his uh, endeavors on the outside that have been, you know, spilling into the product. So with all that being said, let's get to this review of SmackDown. And following this, like I said, I will have my Royal Rumble uh, preview and predictions episode. You're going to want to check that out. We're going to break that down really good for you guys. So we started off SmackDown with the Apex Predator, Randy Orton. He made his way out and simply put, he said, look, at the Royal Rumble tomorrow, I'm going to become a 15-time WWE champion. I am picking Roman Reigns to retain. But I am not at all opposed to seeing Randy Orton uh, get the victory and become champion. I'd be here for it. Shortly thereafter, he's interrupted by AJ Styles. And then lo and behold, we see LA Knight. LA Knight, well, let's just jump to his part right here. He tells AJ to quit his crying because he doesn't want to fight Solo Sokoa tonight. But as far as he can see it, it's real convenient that he's the only one of the four that will be in this fatal four-way match on Saturday night uh, that has a scheduled matchup. And that tells him Paul Heyman lobbied to get him softened up because he's the biggest threat going into this championship bout. He said he's going to walk in later tonight. He's not going to complain about it. Says he'll hit Solo Sokoa so hard, he'll do one of his dad's dance moves, which was great to see. Obviously, his father being Rikishi. And then he'll walk over the three of them to win the title. And that's not an insult. That's just a fact of life. Yeah. So then Styles hits a super kick, follows it up by laying Orton out with a Pele kick as well. And uh, that was pretty much it as far as the introductory segment. This led us to our next matchup here, which uh, ended very interestingly. I cannot wait to talk about it. So we have Carlito going up against Santos Escobar. This was a fun match. And towards the conclusion of this match, there is all kinds of chaos. Of course, uh, Santos Escobar with this new Legado del Fantasma crew, which I really like. Angel and Humberto on one side. On the other side, we have uh, the LWO backing Carlito, being Joaquin Wild, Cruz del Toro, Selena Vega over there. And so... Uh, we see on the other side that Cruz del Toro uh, takes out a couple of the guys uh, from Legado del Fantasma. We see uh, Selena Vega is up on the apron, and she gets pulled down by this, this female. We're not quite sure who it is. Uh, she's pulled to the floor and knocked right down. And who is it? But none other than NXT superstar Electra Lopez, the original leading lady of Legado del Fantasma in NXT, when it was Santos Escobar, uh, Cruz del Toro, and of course, Joaquin Wild and Electra Lopez, uh, again, was the leading lady until they were called up to SmackDown about a year, year and a half ago. She was then replaced by Selena Vega. And now that Santos has built this new Legato del Fantasma, it looks like he found his new leading lady, which is the original from NXT, Electra Lopez. I love it. Uh, Santos Escobar, by the way, ended up winning this match by pinfall uh, with the folding press. I am very intrigued and what a week it's been for Electra Lopez I'm hoping we see her later tonight in the Royal Rumble and that's simply because you know earlier this week she split with Lola Vice she's been with her for months now on NXT but it left me a little confused because she took out Lola Vice on Tuesday they have a match scheduled for this coming Tuesday and although I loved it it seemed like Electra Lopez she was on a mean streak but it seemed like she was turning babyface since Lola Vice is the heel now, Electra Lopez coming to SmackDown with what looks to be full-time, maybe after this match on Tuesday on NXT, becoming the new leading lady of Legado del Fantasma on SmackDown, it, it makes me wonder that, okay, now she's back to being a heel, because obviously this new Santos stable is definitely heel, L LWO being the babyfaces uh, of the two groups. 
So I'm not opposed to it. I love this attitude, uh, this renewed sense uh, of Electra Lopez. I hope she gets the win over Lola Vice uh, this coming Tuesday on NXT. I really do. Uh, I'll be sad to see her go, but she's got bigger and better things uh, going on on SmackDown. And I am totally okay with her being the leading lady of Legado del Fantasma yet again. So, so we'll see what happens here. Uh, we'll see what happens between these two groups. I'm honestly hoping that, again, Electra Lopez is in this uh, Women's Royal Rumble later tonight. Maybe having it, uh, some kind of an exchange yet again for the second consecutive night with Selena Vega. Would love to see it. Now, I've been waiting for this. It's been a long time coming. I always wondered if and when they would bring Electra Lopez up, not just up to the main roster, but uh, for her and Selena to feud at some point. Because you gotta, you got to know, in real life and storyline, Electra's got to be feeling some type of way. You kind of just left me high and dry down there in NXT. And uh, even though I think it was the best for her to kind of rebuild, revamp herself, and I was just simply replaced by Zelina Vega for Legato initially, then the LWO. And so what's that all about? So moving on here, and I got to mention early on in the show, I noticed this, and I love the fact that uh, WWE or Triple H or whomever thought of this idea uh, brought back uh, what looked to be the gold tumbler uh, for the Royal Rumble numbers. It, each participant got to pick uh, from there to see what number uh, they received. You know, we got to see SmackDown GM Nick Aldis back there alongside uh, with NXT GM uh, Ava Rain, who was appointed this past Tuesday by Shawn Michaels alongside William Regal. And uh, it, it's very cool to see. It brought me back to the nostalgia of the, the 90s, you know, or mid 90s, namely, uh, where they would go, you know, backstage in that room, pick your number out. And uh, I don't remember the last time they did that. It's definitely been a while, but that was uh, good to see that. Uh, so we got to see that through, throughout the duration of the show, whether it was uh, Our Truth or uh, Jimmy Uso and countless other superstars uh, that went back there uh, for this segment to pick their number. Some pleased, some not uh, happy with what number they drew. Obviously, we didn't find out um, what number they received, but uh, they would, you know, Ava would jot down whoever got what, and that was that. So now here we had a WWE Women's Tag Team Championship match. We had the Kabuki Warriors of Damage Control, Asuka and Kairi Sane, uh, going up against the champions, Katana Chance and Kaden Carter. Uh, simply put, I'm just going to get to the end result of this match, and then I want to elaborate on it. So the Kabuki Warriors win by pinfall with an inverted DDT slash uh, diving elbow drop combination on Kaden Carter, winning the WWE Women's Tag Team Championships for the second time. The first time, I want to say, was in 2019. They held those tag team titles uh, all the way up through WrestleMania 36 uh, during COVID. And then they lost uh, the tag team titles at WrestleMania 36 to, I believe it was Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, who they initially got those tag titles off of uh, later on in 2019. So again, you know, kudos to them. Congrats to them. First time winning these tag titles yet again in the better part of uh, four and a half years. It's been a long time. Kyrie ended up leaving. Uh, WWE in the first place in October of 2020, at least as a wrestler. I know she worked uh, backstage or she had some kind of position with the company for another year until 2021 and then heading back to Japan uh, for a few years. But I'm glad to see them win. But if I had it my way, there's two things I would have done here. A, I would have at minimum had Kaden Carter and Katana Chance go up against Asuka and Kyrie at the Royal Rumble just one night later and have them drop at a core four pay-per-view. I mean, why not just do it there, in my opinion? That's what I would have done. Uh, but best case scenario, I mean, to me, I was hoping Caden and Katana held these women's tag team championships uh, all the way through WrestleMania 40. I was, if anything, as I said on a, a most recent episode, I think of the SmackDown review last week, I was kind of thinking the foreshadowing was there. I was saying, you know what, it looks like Asuka and Kairi Sane are well on their way uh, to winning these tag titles, and hopefully it's at WrestleMania 40. Um, but I was right, but I didn't know it was going to be this early, I'll tell you that. I didn't think it was going to be on the following episode of SmackDown the night before the Royal Rumble. I was very surprised uh, that that took place. So instead of making it to WrestleMania 40, you know, Caden and Katana won these championships in December. And so they only held the tag titles for 40 days. So I was disappointed to see that. I know Triple H uh, put out a very nice tweet on Friday night in regards to, you know, Caden and Katana and, you know, that there's a lot more in store, something along those lines uh, for them and from them. And but you could just tell um, 
you can just tell, obviously, Caden and Katana were very disappointed um, with the loss, the end result. I mean, you know, Royal Rumble leading through Mania, it's, it's the entirety of the road to WrestleMania. And so losing that momentum just when things are about to pick up and then having those titles yanked from you, I feel for them. I, I feel for them a whole lot. It reminds me of a couple of tag teams in the men's division in the last couple of years uh, that were on the road to WrestleMania, but they were stopped short because they weren't looked at as, uh, you know, that team to uh, either be champions or defending at Mania. It happened to the Hurt Business a couple of years ago. I want to say around 2021, it happened to Cedric and Shelton. And then I think the following year, I want to say it was 2022, uh, Otis and Chad Gable, right? Alpha Academy, they were the tag team champions as well. And they were cut short as well. I want to say they lost to RK Bro. And again, the year prior to that, uh, when the Hurt Business were stopped short, I, I want to say they lost to the New Day. So they obviously, WWE, they went for the sexier names in the sense of, you know, the more popular superstars or the better tag team in their eyes. And I get it, the New Day, you know, multi-time champs, one of the longest reigning tag champions of all time until the Usos uh, recently beat them for that record last year. And the same could be said about uh, Alpha Academy. I would have loved to see them defend at Mania a couple of years ago, but of course they went with Randy Orton and and uh, Matt Riddle at the time. So so be it. Again, uh, my heart bleeds for Katana and Caden. Again, they're the only true tag team on the women's roster. They've been a tag team for the better part of four, four and a half years uh, coming up from NXT uh, about a year ago or so. So that was the end result as far as that was concerned. So this was an interesting segment. We finally got to see Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits uh, go face to face with the final testament, that being Karrion Cross's group comprised of AOP, Paul Ellering, and his wife, Scarlett. This was, this was pretty good. You know, obviously Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits looking sharp as always. And the final testament, uh, he calls them out. He says, come get some. Uh, they make their way out. First, we see the Authors of Pain carrying cross. Then again, we saw Paul Ellering and Scarlett. Uh, Scarlett makes her way into the ring, the leading lady. And Lashley says, what kind of coward leaves his lady to do his work for him? Dawkins says, this was supposed to be a face-to-face. -face. And Ford says, He's figured it out. Final Testament or scared. Paul Ellering says there's no fear in carrying Cross. Cross says Ellering speaks the truth. And all he sees in the men in the ring is frustration, desperation, and he understands. They feel like things aren't necessarily going according to plan anymore, like they're not in control. And guess what? They're not. But he'll give Bob one thing, Bobby Lashley. They were supposed to do this face to face. And here Lashley standing across from the prettiest face in the world. But they're not getting their fight tonight. Bobby says he'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but they lied because they certainly are fighting tonight. The Street Profits jump to the floor, but Scarlett jumps on Lashley's back, claws at his eyes. Cross then rushes in and takes Lashley out as AOP beat the Profits down. And that was pretty much that as far as that segment was concerned. It was good. I'm looking forward to the continued build and story with these two. Would not be surprised to see Karrion Cross and Bobby Lashley go at it in the ring uh, during the course of the Royal Rumble. We'll see if AOP are going to be in there, the Street Profits. I mean, there's just so many uh, men in WWE on Raw, on SmackDown, and of course NXT, which last year we didn't see anybody from NXT come up uh, for the men's Royal Rumble. I know for the women we saw too, uh, being Roxanne Perez and Zoe Stark, who was still on NXT at the time. Uh, so we'll see this year if we'll get any men from NXT up there. But we'll see if AOP and the Street Profits are involved in this Rumble and can come to their aid. But either way, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing Karrion Cross and Bobby Lashley having a moment uh, in that ring later tonight. So here we have a rematch of two weeks ago. Again, this ended in a referee stoppage due to a uh, scary injury at the time. Austin Theory coming down very uh, brutal on his head, uh, as well as Carmelo Hayes. Uh, so we got this rematch here. Uh, Theory wins by pinfall with an O'Connor roll and a handful of tights. So obviously he cheated. Uh, Post-match, Theory and Waller go to beat Hayes down. Uh, Trick Williams shows up, though, makes the save. Miami was thrilled to see him. Uh, they were all yelling in unison, whoop that Trick, which is pretty amazing to see because, you know, a lot of, uh, obviously he gets that ovation on NXT, but a lot of people that watch Raw and SmackDown don't necessarily uh, watch NXT. So it doesn't always translate over to the main roster. So once his music dropped, uh, once that beat dropped and people started hearing it and, and seeing exactly who it was and they were yelling, whoop that Trick, I was thrilled for him because now it's not just NXT, it's Raw, it's SmackDown, it's WWE Universe as a whole, uh, enjoying Trick Williams. He's had quite the run the past six months, uh, so I got to give him credit, and honestly, it falls right in place 
uh, with this Trick Williams, Carmelo Hayes storyline. It worked perfectly, uh, them giving him that reaction. And the most interesting part about this is uh, once they cleared the ring, that being Austin Theory and Grayson Waller, uh, Carmelo Hayes wanted to thank uh, Trick Williams and dap him up. And Trick, you know, is just a little hesitant with the way uh, Carmelo Hayes has been acting the last couple of months. We can't blame him at all. And Trick Williams says, no, he's like, I just came out here to save you because we have a big match on Tuesday against the LWO to make it to those uh, Dusty Rhodes Tag Team Classic uh, finals to go up against Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin. So this was a business decision. This wasn't necessarily uh, because we go way back and we're best friends. So you could keep that. And so good for him standing on his own, standing his ground. And, and so that was super interesting to see. Now, here we're jumping to the main event of the night. I believe this was L.A. Knight versus Solo Sokoa. Uh, this was a good match. It really was, uh, as expected. Uh, L.A. Knight won by disqualification. Now, post-match, this is where business really picked up. A.J. Styles picks L.A. Knight up, throws him into the steel steps. Jimmy Uso gives Styles a chair and tells him, you know, this is what you got to do. A.J. picks the chair up, doesn't get on L.A. Knight, and Solo Sokoa orders him to hit L.A. Knight before he takes care of him himself. A.J. refused to, hits Solo with the chair instead. Here comes Randy Orton. AJ slides in the ring, uh, but Orton cuts him off with an uppercut, snap scoop power slam on Uso, but Sokoa pulls Randy out of the ring and to the commentary table. Orton cut him off and back suplexes him into the announce desk, hanging DDT on Jimmy Uso. I love seeing that. He's been doing that for years, as long as that scoop suplex and, of course, uh, the RKO, which we all enjoy. Styles then appeared with the phenomenal forearm, but Randy ducked it, uh, hits the hanging DDT on him as well. He goes to that special place. You know what that means? RKO on AJ Styles, LA Knight out of nowhere with the BFT, the Blunt Force Trauma on Randy Orton, and that ended the show. The show literally went off uh, as soon as Orton, uh, as soon as Orton was hit with that BFT. So this was a very good show. Uh, SmackDown again, very exciting, <laughs> very enjoyable in a lot of ways. Of course, within the first half hour, finding uh, outside of watching SmackDown on the internet, the Vince McMahon news, which I think a lot of people were relieved. It's been that dark cloud hovering over WWE for years now, especially since Thursday. Hated to see that happen. Um, of course, you know, if it's all true to that individual, that young lady uh, that went through all this, uh, that, you know, speaking up against Vince McMahon, again, if you want to read that on your own time, feel free to do it. It's just a very sticky situation that I'm not going to repeat on this podcast. But, you know, being that Vince McMahon has officially resigned, Slim Jim is back sponsoring WWE full-time now. And, and so on and so forth, and the fans can be happy and just enjoy the product is what we're here for. You know, of course, we like to read the dirt sheets sometimes and, you know, what's going on behind the scenes in pro wrestling, uh, regardless what you watch, you know, WWE, AEW, TNA, whatever it is, New Japan. But, you know, you don't want to read the kind of stuff that we all stumbled upon on Thursday with Vince. And it's sad to see, honestly, you know, a lot of us in, enjoyed uh, WWF over the years and appreciate what he helped bring us and build this juggernaut, this empire of WWE. But come on, you know, that's just um, very disturbing stuff that we, that we had uh, read on Thursday. And so uh, that being said, you know, not going to bring that up anymore going forward. And so that was SmackDown, very enjoyable show. And guys, if you enjoyed this, then be sure to check out my Royal Rumble preview prediction show uh, coming out later this evening uh, before the Royal Rumble. Be sure to check that out. I'm going to go through the men's Rumble, the women's Rumble, the United States Championship match. And of course, the undisputed WWE Universal Championship where Roman Reigns uh, will be defending against three other men in that ring. Uh, it's going to be good. So I'm looking forward to it. Again, only a four-match card. Uh, but hey, quality over quantity speaks for itself. So as always, thank you for tuning in to the Turnbuckle Topics Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Thanine, and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening.